in a way, it's not that dissimilar from how we see, right? Like we have our eyes, the eyes kind of take in raw <laughs> light and turn that into a signal. And that signal goes through the nerve and finally gets back to the back of the brain. And by that point, it's not that interpretable either, right? It doesn't necessarily correspond to language. But then there's some further connector that like turns that visual data into something that I can understand as language or at least understand and then articulate as language. So it, it feels like there is something kind of analogous taking shape in the AI world. Imagine you are a human, you grew up learning only knowledge and now one day you, you can open your eyes. Right? You don't really know how to, how to interpret what, what you see. So, so that's what we are trying to do here uh, to kind of build this bridge be between these two modalities. Hello, and welcome to The Cognitive Revolution, where we interview visionary researchers, entrepreneurs, and builders working on the frontier of artificial intelligence. Each week, we'll explore their revolutionary ideas, and together, we'll build a picture of how AI technology will transform work, life, and society in the coming years. I'm Nathan LeBenz, joined by my co-host, Eric Torenberg. Omniki uses generative AI to enable you to launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work, customized across all platforms with a click of a button. I believe in Omniki so much that I invested in it, and I recommend you use it too. Use CogRev to get a 10% discount. Today's episode was a fun one for me. Researchers Junan Lee and Dong Shu Li, both of Salesforce Research's Singapore office, have co-authored some of the most practically useful computer vision papers of the last year. As recently as January 2021, the challenge of using AI to interpret what is going on in a photograph was considered to be nowhere near solved. But just a year later, Junan and Dongshu changed all that by publishing and open sourcing Blip, a family of pre-trained models that delivered state-of-the-art performance on image captioning, visual question answering, and image text matching. For Waymark, my company, Blip was a godsend. Suddenly, we had a reliable way to understand the contents of users' images, allowing us to make useful image suggestions for the very first time. This was something we had worked toward for years. Unusually in today's AI landscape, Blip has held the title of best image captioner for over a year, ultimately becoming the 18th most cited AI paper of 2022. And more recently, just as worthy rivals to Blip started to come online, Junan and Dongshu changed the game again with Blip 2. As an aside, for a funny moment in Cognitive Revolution history, you can listen back to episode one, in which Suhail tells me about the release of Blip 2 live on the show, forcing me to clear my calendar for the rest of the afternoon to go check it out. Now, Blip 2 uses a different approach, which I think may ultimately prove even more influential. Rather than training a large model end-to-end, -end, this time they trained a much smaller model that connects a frozen vision model to a frozen language model. This strategy has several benefits. First, because it injects semantic visual information into the language model's latent space, you can now have an open-ended dialogue about an image in which the language model shows remarkably detailed and nuanced understanding. Second, because the connector model is so much smaller, training time and cost are dramatically reduced. Blip2 was trained on just a single A100 machine in less than 10 days making it easy to upgrade the system as new and more powerful language models become available. You can even use your own fine-tuned language models as well. Small connector models like Blip2 show just how much potential remains to be drawn out of today's large language models and seem likely to play an important role in the great implementation of multimodal AI across society. One note for listeners, both Junan and Dongshu are native Chinese speakers, and while both are perfectly fluent in English, audience members listening at 2x speed might benefit from watching this episode on YouTube, where we've also included subtitles for your convenience. Now enjoy our conversation with Junan Li and Dongshu Li. Junan Li and Dongshu Li, welcome to the Cognitive Revolution. Thanks. Excited to be here. Thanks for having us. So you guys have really done some outstanding work in the subdomain of AI known as computer vision. I guess I, I would even ask you guys right off the bat, like, do you think of yourselves as computer vision specialists or 
now with Blip2 and your work kind of branching into multimodal and models being involved, do you think of yourselves even as kind of beyond computer vision? I'd love to hear how you think about where you fit into the broader AI landscape. Yeah, I think with how AI has been developing, I think the, the boundary between different fields is kind of blurry now. So I think both Dong Xu and I, we started as computer vision people during our PhD, but gradually like uh, it doesn't require like too many expertise really to <laughs> move to another domain. So that's why we start to explore other like language domain and also other domains and try to see how can we also be involved to build better AI models. You know, he's just trying to be humble. He actually has a lot of expertise. <laughs> <laughs> but there is definitely this kind of great convergence phenomenon. Transformers kind of increasingly working for everything. It is uh, amazing to see how quickly people can move from what used to be one subfield to another and just how how much the same techniques are, are really starting to work across these domains. So I find that super fascinating. You guys have also done something that is pretty rare in today's AI landscape, which is that you put out a model almost a year ago now, right? If not, maybe a full year ago was the original release of Blip. And that continued to be state-of-the-art or really neck and neck with one or two other models for state-of-the-art captioning, image captioning model, all the way up until you released your most recent paper, which is Blip 2, which obviously supersedes Blip 1, and I think now is safe to say is kind of the state-of-the-art both captioning model, question-answering model as it pertains to images, and really starting to unlock like longer dialogues and true understanding of images beyond kind of bite-sized captions that we've seen in the past. So I think that's really an amazing accomplishment. In today's AI world, we don't see too many things that can hold the top of the leaderboard for a year. Typically, it's more like a month. Sometimes it's more like a week. Um, but you guys put something out there that really, in, in today's AI context, a year, I would call enduring work. So I want to compliment you on that, but I also want to dig into both kind of the original Blip and Blip 2 and understand like how you guys get, got into these projects, how they work, how you train them. And we, we really do want to go pretty deep on that. Um, so maybe let's start with the, the original Blip. Um, tell us about kind of the origin of that project and how it all came together. Sure, sure. Thanks for the compliment, uh, by the way. So I think uh, actually before Blip, we have a, a previous one or two paper in this visual language domain. So for me, actually, my first paper is this LBAP. I'm not sure if you have heard, but uh, it's also being accepted at uh, New Rips. And that is kind of when we started to explore this field and feel like there's something we can do here. Uh, so in the LBAP, it's kind of at the same time as Clip. Uh, the, from Open here uh, was published. We we published LBF short after that, and in that paper we found out that the idea was that we want to build this kind of multi-model encoder that can understand both image and text. So Clip is kind of a unimodal encoder. Right? You have the image encoder, you have the text encoder, and you can compute the similarity. And what we found is that we can build on top of that kind of contrast learning approach to have another kind of this fusion encoder to encode both image and text together. And we find that achieves quite good performance on some parts that requires understanding of both image and text because of this fusion mechanism. Uh, so, so that's actually where we started. And then we, we find out that this kind of encoder architecture is good at some understanding task, but it's not really that good at uh, uh, generation task, in particular text generation task, like captioning or BQA that requires an open end generation. So in the play paper, actually the architecture, we, we heavily uh, inherit our LBF architecture, but we made some change such that the encoder can also function as, as a decoder. So we, we propose this, what we call a mixture of encoder and decoder model, which basically like a single model with shared parameter, but you can switch uh, from either an encoder or a decoder. So that's what where the architecture kind of uh, uh, of comes from. And then we also find out that uh, 
in order to train this model, right, you, you need a lot of data from this web uh, domain, like image text pairs. And uh, for, for previous method like clip, you just want to do contrast learning, right? You want to learn encoder. Then it's fine that you have a lot of noise in those data set, like line, those big data that have a lot of noise. If you just want to do contrast learning to do uh, representation learning, uh, the noise is fine most of the time. But if you want to do image captioning, this noise can really be quite harmful uh, because this language model noise is more like a finer grain version uh, than the contrast you lost. Right? So, so that's where another kind of contribution uh, of our big was that we kind of bootstrap this data set uh, so that uh, it has synthetic generated captions. And also we use this filter to remove the noisy captions. Uh, and there's basically these two pieces, the architecture per, uh, perspective and the data set perspective together uh, makes believe work. You filtered, or did you? Do, how did you remove the noise from the data set? Some of the captions that actually describe the image have a high similarity score with their the corresponding text encoding, but then it's just such a big data set. There's so much noise in there. You've got a lot of things that are just like, "What an awesome day!" and that doesn't really line up with what's in the image. So that can add noise to the system. It sounds like in your case, to create a captioner, this was working against you. So did you just go through the giant data set and just kind of filter out things with low similarity score and work from that? Yeah, exactly. Like what you described, we just go through all the examples and filter out those that are not aligned with the image. Uh, and uh, I think it's a perfect point that in some cases that noise could be good. Uh, like I mentioned, in contrast with learning stage, noise could be good. Because really, you are just learning one single vector, right? You are not really trying to generate the text. But in the more like captioning space, let's say you give an image, you want to generate text. If the text is totally irrelevant to the image, then the model could learn something that, that we are not trying to learn. It learns, it doesn't capture anything from the image. It tries to hallucinate some stuff out of the, uh, basically, there's no context. Right? So I think that's something we try to, to avoid. Remind me, how big is the original blip model? It's like one to two gigabytes downloaded, if I recall correctly. It's not huge, but it's so yeah, tell me tell me about the size and kind of the training dynamics. I want to contrast that ultimately to the blip two uh, successor. Yeah, I think that's actually a beauty part about blip two is that if you compare the number of trainable parameters, so this train meaning that you are using backpropagation to optimize uh, the gradient. Actually, Blip is larger than Blip2 in, in that uh, trainable uh, parameter, uh, the count for that. Blip have a few hundred millions, but Blip2 only have less than 200 million. So the reason is, I think in Blip, we are training everything end-to-end. -end. So including this vision encoder, this language model, right? everything we train end-to-end. -end. Uh, but in Blip2, we have this frozen image encoder, which we don't update at all. And we have this frozen, this large language model, which is very large. It has a, can, can be a few billion parameter. But because we keep it frozen right, during pre-training, it actually incurs very little computation cost. So if you just compare how much time and GPU we need to take uh, during this pre-training, Blip2 is actually cheaper than Blip because we use this already off-the-shelf available models that built by other amazing research teams. On the, on the original Blip, is the what are you optimizing for there? Are you just optimizing for generating the exact caption, like token by token, or is there some more kind of abstracted or like semantic uh, loss function that you're optimizing against? So actually, uh, uh, this blip right is a inheritor of this LBAP paper. So the our optimization function, we can, actually if you look at LBAP blip and blip two. We have kind of this on the uh, foundational laws, which are the very similar. So there are basically three laws that we use. One is the contrast for learning, like it's the same as what Clip used to learn better reputations and align align this image and text colors. Can you unpack the contrastive learning a little bit better? I mean, I, I think most people will be familiar with Clip, and I think they'll understand it largely as kind of 
the thing that somehow, some way, stable diffusion somehow is downstream of, and so it's important. I don't think people have a great sense in general of what exactly the insight there was that created that possibility. So give us a little bit more on that before we go on to the next two papers. Sure, sure. So uh, this term contrastive learning actually originates before clip is from online computer vision field. I would say that. Uh, so basically the idea is that you want to learn some kind of remutations for your data, such that if your data is similar, like in semantic meanings, they should have similar reputation. And when we consider this for image and text domain, what it does is that you have this positive pairs, right? so-called positive pairs is what uh, you collected from the web, is you have an image and text, and they are, they are correlated. And you want to train the model such that their reputations for this positive pair is more similar to each other, compared to the similarity for negative pairs. So these negative pairs are basically random sample image and text pairs that don't correlate to, to each other. And so what this loss does is it trains this uh, image and text encoder. They, they don't interact with each other until the last stage. So they, they will extract this image and text features individually. Uh, that's why we also call them like unimodal encoders because they don't interact uh, with each other. But after you extract the features, the final stage is you compute their similarity. So that's where they interact. And this very simple mechanism, you just use the dot product, uh, which measures the cos cosine similarity of these normalized embeddings. Right? And you try to maximize the embeddings, the similarity of the embeddings from this positive pair. So that's kind of contrastive learning how it works is it's quite a simple mechanism. Uh, and in the end, what you get is you get this very good image and text encoders right, that can produce good reputations that represents what they, their semantic meanings are. That's why Clip, like the VIT of Clip and text encoder of Clip has been really successful applied to different downstream tasks because they captured the semantic meanings of those uh, data. Cool. Go, let's go back to the history then. Yeah, so, uh, so the first loss, right, is this contrastive loss that gives you good unimodal encoders. Right? But then if you want to do more finer grain interaction between the image and text, you need more than just a dot product. You need some parameterized mechanism to interact. So that's where we have this cross attention, uh, where you have the text encoder that can cross attend to the image encoder. So it's kind of like consider a T5 an encoder decoder architecture right? where the encoder is your VIT and your decoder is your text model. Um, so in the term, uh, in, in, when we consider image captioning loss, basically this text decoder will cross attend to the image encoder and generate the, the text tokens. So that's basically our second loss, which is the standard image captioning loss. Uh, it's just a not language model that allows it, but conditioned on, on the image. And our third loss, right, is, is what we call image text matching loss. So the purpose of this loss is that we want to learn even finer grain similarity or, or kind of matching between the image and text through this cross attention mechanism. So, so you can't really expect a single vector to capture all the finer grain details of one image, right? Because the image is worse, a thousand words. So there are so many ways to describe this image. So, so uh, this a single vector is very concentrated and good reputation, but if you really want to find a grain, you need this cross attention. So, so for this image text matching analysis, kind of a binary classification task where we give the model an image and text pair, right? and we ask the model through this cross attention after this computation to tell me whether this is a matched uh, a pair or not matched pair. So by doing this, we can further enhance this alignment between these two modalities. Uh, so this is basically what the image text matching loss does. And in our experiment, we find that these three laws complement each other, meaning that they have this uh, uh, multitask learning 
kind of uh, objective will enhance the final performance for each individual loss uh, and objective. So this like through different experiments, that's why we we fix those three loss as kind of the standard loss losing. And I think uh, many other papers also kind of now will adopt this three loss or something similar. One of the things that I think Blip has notably done better than any other model that I've tried is handling logos. Like can almost read the logos. Uh, a lot of times it like kind of you know, fudges the the words from the logo. So help us understand that. Like as a, uh, you know, just as a user, I see this really interesting behavior. Other captioning models really struggle with logos. And you may know that. Blip does quite well. Um, how did you manage to do that? Was that a matter of like the training data or was there, is there a technical reason that that happens? And then also when I do see something, if it's like the Coca-Cola logo, it'll just know, okay, that's or the Salesforce logo. It's going to know that's the Salesforce logo. But when I have these long tail, small business logos, it's like probably never seen them before. I imagine most of them are not in the training set. And then you'll see these things where it might be like Torenberg plumbing. And instead it'll say like, Torrenstein plumbing, right? It'll, it'll be like almost the right name, but it'll kind of just flip it a little bit on like the last couple of letters and the last token. And I've always kind of wondered like, what is happening there? You know, where it, it clearly can sort of recognize the letters, but it's not doing like a, exactly an OCR type mechanism, obviously. And so I'm, I'm always been kind of confused as to how it ends up just being a little bit off in those uh, scenarios. But I'd love to understand that. Yeah, I think that's... Quite a fascinating phenomenon. I really didn't really <laughs> observe this before, but uh, I think in terms of why Blip can understand logos, I would say it's mostly from the pre-training data that we use. Uh, and we are one of the first to scale up to this high-end data set. Uh, yeah, I think we, once after Line released this 400 million data set, we started to, to use it to train the captioning model. And so there are a lot of logos in that data. So I would imagine if Blip can learn such information, like web scale data. And of course, these data are quite noisy. And so it's likely that some spelling error can lead to a wrong recognition of the logo text. Uh, but I would still say that it is not a perfect OCR model because it's not really designed to do OCR. Right? The, the VIT itself, even though powerful, it's not really, at least compared to the best OCR architecture, it's not the same mechanism, right? So OCR have this detect, detect first, and then you uh, really zoom in, right, to do each individual letters and you recognize. But VIT is more like a holistic view of the image and you're trying to recognize more, maybe the most salient part of the text. So that's why if the text is small, uh, it may fail. And another reason, like you mentioned, is if it's not a common name that appears frequently in the training data, the model may not really know that name. So it lacks the prior information to spell out the correct uh, name. Uh, and I'm not sure, maybe Blip2 will be better at this because we are using a larger language model that have more knowledge about the word. So maybe it knows more companies. So there's stronger prior to, to give you the correct information. Yeah, I, I mean, if I want to add something to that, like. Uh, I think that's the emerging uh, advantage of this contrastive learning in the context of multimodal data. If you look at the uh, some of the earlier models, I mean, uh, before Albif and the uh, Blip, uh, many models are actually using some off-the-shelf detectors to provide uh, object-level uh, labels. But because of the usage of these uh, object detectors, they won't be able to necessarily take into account this logo information. Because if you look at these detectors, uh, uh, they, they usually don't, don't turn to detect the logos. Like the boxes, tables, but not the logos. I think one uh, emerging uh, property, uh, since ever the contrast learning was introduced for Blip and Albef, is that uh, you don't need this uh, uh, off-the-shelf detectors anymore. Uh, these contrastive laws, they really very well align the captions each text tokens in the caption to the corresponding region in the image. 
And because of that, uh, this text, uh, if you see some text in the logo, that really uh, aligns to the text appearing in the, uh, in the caption. So that gives kind of the alignment uh, on this logo thing and the, uh, the text uh, words. And I think it is, there is no OCR loss for that, but uh, we also have some other two members who try to adapt lead to the OCR uh, context, which turns out to work uh, pretty well. And uh, that really demonstrates this foundational model are critical to serve for general, general purposes uh, for the model model understanding uh, without too much, you know, uh, task specific designs or task specific, uh, which is just a little bit uh, uh, adjustment. Uh, this foundation model could be used for different uh, uh, scenarios, applications, which is quite nice. So with the original blip, you said it's end-to-end -end training. It, there's, is it correct to say that there is no knowledge before that end-to-end -end training? Like the, the only text that blip ever has seen is the image captions that are associated with the images. There's no other text pre-training or anything like that that's being built on top of. Do I have that right? Uh, actually, we do use a pre-trained BERT model to initialize this text encoder. So of course, BERT now is not considered to, to be the best language model, but still, if you consider its size, it has some decent text understanding capabilities. So that allows us to initialize with a model that already knows text. Then we start to train it on this caption to enhance its capability. What was the total training time like for the original blip model? Yeah, so if I recall correctly, we use this 32 800 GPUs. Uh, and the training takes about, for the largest model of blip, takes about a week to finish. I, I was under the impression it was even longer. So that's actually pretty reasonably efficient. How many cycles did you guys go through in the process of doing that research? Like, did you run that week-long training process five times, 50 times, 500 times? We all see the one end product, but how many you know, uh, earlier versions of it were there that, that ultimately got tossed out? Yeah, so actually during research, we really start with not the largest model and relatively like a smaller size and smaller training data. Uh, so we can iterate faster and maybe within a few days, we, we, we know how the training is going and we can adjust. And, and, and because we already have this LBAP work to kind of give us a solid, uh, this pre-training loss, we didn't really make any adjustment about uh, the, the, the losses because we are quite certain it will work well. And we made some adjustment to the model architecture because we have this one model that can do both decoder and encoder, right? So we do do some ablations on that. Uh, I think in total, maybe less than a hundred trials, <laughs> maybe tens or twenties trials uh, until we finalize the, the final model architecture. Right? and the, the pre-training strategy. And what, what would you say were the biggest things that you learned or adjusted during that process? Is it like a sort of learning rate schedule or other hyperparameters or something else? Yeah, actually, uh, we didn't really have a single thing that gave us a significant boost. So I would say mostly the model is robust to different changes. So the, uh, we do observe some kind of instability in training if we increase the learning rate uh, too much. So the loss may go to none sometimes uh, for mysterious reasons. So that's why we decided to kind of keep the learning rate a bit lower. And in terms of other hyperparameters like the batch size, we just feed, feed in the largest batch size we can fit within the 32 GPUs. And also the data and the pre-training loss we, didn't really make too much changes. We like tweak the architecture a little bit, but it's more like uh, there is a trade-off between your efficiency and your performance, and we find a sweet point uh, that gives us the best performance while still being efficient. So this it's thirty-two GPUs and like seven days. So that is essentially 
whatever, 200 ish GPU days. That's a significant amount of compute. Um, yeah. So just, just to jump in, so like if you, there are, I think, tons of models that you can transfer way longer hours than that. <laughs> so uh, even uh, some of the earlier models, they, although they are not as flexible, uh, they require uh, way longer hours. To, I think that's also uh, shows that this model is how the architecture is how efficient to capture this model model. Um, this two hundred uh, GPU days uh, is. Indeed, a lot. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, if you just think about it, it is about awesome. uh, If you look at Keep and uh, Align, especially this one's from Google, uh, they maybe trains on like tens of thousands of GPU hours, I would say, at least. And um, I think uh, at least uh, tens of times more training data than Bleep. Uh, well, Saying that, Leap is still able to uh, achieve a comparable, uh, I, I would say in most of cases, even better performance. I think that really demonstrates that uh, it's important to make good choices on architecture and training strategies um, in addition to proper scaling in terms of data sets. I don't know if you guys know the answer to this question, but I looked it up um, just today. How... If you don't know, I'd love to hear what you would guess is the number of times that the original blip model has been downloaded from Hugging Face in the last month, just the last month. Uh, <laughs> I'm not too sure, like uh, because I think blip was uploaded to Transformer not long ago, right? The Transformer, the Hugging Face team uh, integrated blip like half a year or maybe less. I would guess. 1,000? Maybe 3,000, I would say. From just the last month, mind you, just under 20,000 downloads of the original. Which model was that? Caption model? Or... Well, that's a good question. Let me see. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, yeah, we, we sometimes also uh, take a look at the statistics and we feel quite excited about it. And we also learn quite a lot from how people are using, or how people are using it, and we see a lot of different uh, application scenarios that we wasn't actually expecting, but it was amazing. And uh, yeah, I just really appreciate the the community effort and feedback. And I think that really also helped us a lot in uh, developing a better idea of what the model is uh, is doing and where we are going to in the future. Just to answer your question, it is the blip image captioning base model that has been downloaded exactly, according to Hugging Face, 18,976 times in the last month. That's amazing. I'd love to hear some of those stories of unexpected use cases. Um, and maybe you could also just tell, give us like a little bit of guidelines for anyone who's thinking, okay, how do I get in on this action? I would say, by the way, too, for Waymark, we do not fine tune the model. We just use the base, the kind of web scale data that you trained it on. Base works really well for us. I'd love to help the audience understand, like, what would it take for them to do a fine tuning in terms of data set, any gotchas that you guys have observed, compute resources that they would need to go into that? Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, definitely something I would also want to say is that uh, if you want to fine tune Blip, we have the support in our Lavis library. And so we spent a lot of time and effort last year to build this library that really offers you not uh, only the very convenient inference using our models, but also training and benchmarking. So we set up this framework where you can do training of our pre-trained models, uh, you can fine tune them uh, also quite easily uh, using your custom data set. Uh, so all you need to do is maybe you prepare the data set in a certain format, uh, and then you write some configuration files uh, and follow the default ones, but if you want to change some hyperparameters, you can also override them. Right? 
and then you call our uh, tra train our master to 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 train the model. And in terms of compute, I think it, it depends. Like of course, if you have a lot of GPUs, that's great. But if not, it takes longer to train. But for the base model, like a few one or two GPUs can still run the training. It just may take longer. You may need to do some gradient accumulations stuff. And uh, I think any size of data set would work. Of course, if you have only a tens of uh, hundreds of captions, maybe uh, I'm not sure how much effect it will have. But let's say if I have hundreds of captions, I would say that's worth a try to fine tune. Uh, so that's kind of uh, the strategy that uh, I, I I would suggest to do the bleep fine tuning. And for bleep two, we also provide this fine tuning. Uh, in the in the same Navis library, uh, but that would may require a bit more computing resource because we use these large language models. So even if we keep them frozen, uh, I think for the uh, our smallest this OPT two hundred uh, two point seven billion, you still need a decent amount of GPU memory. Uh, I would say I think a V hundred should be enough to 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 run this fine tuning uh, using the smallest leap two. Uh, model that that that, that we provide, uh, but for Clip two, I think most of the time you don't really need fine tuning because uh, it's quite generalizable to different scenarios. Uh, and I've seen several several use cases uh, uh, for you, you using this captioning. Uh, I think last year we saw this quite interesting use case where they they generate captions for this Pokemon <laughs> images. And fine tune a stable diffusion to generate the Pokemon based on the the text. So that's one uh, interesting use case that I've seen before. And recently, I find there's another demo that use captions to do this image search. So that's also something we have been uh, exploring. Is these texts are kind of a, a concentrated representation of your image, and it's human interpretable, right? Uh, and and if you just trans translate every image to text, the amount of like information is is concentrated to these very small uh, uh basically text tokens, right? They occupy very small space compared to, to to the original image. And you can use all these existing technique like sentence embeddings to do very fast similarity search across a wide uh, database. And uh, that gives you an uh, alternative way to do this image to image search uh, and also even image to text search. Yeah, if I, I were to add something to how you want to use the uh, big captioning model, I would say first, I strongly recommend to take a look at the Leap 2 model. Uh, we have tried that one in our uh, some uh, some of our uh, recent experiments, and we find that the captions from Bleep do are uh, significantly better than the Bleep. Um, because what's happening there, I think it also depends kind of on your use case. For Bleep, the the model the the captioning model released there was fine tuned on cocoa caption and the the effect of that you will say you you kind of observe that the description sometimes tends to be a little bit generic in the sense that uh, it kind of lose the very um specific uh, uh namings uh kind of stuff if you look at the bleep two we have multiple versions of the captioning model release and um, some of them are just patron on the Lion and the other web data set. And if you use that model, that actually gives you very concrete and uh, I would say customize the names of the object. It can recognize, the, for example, the uh, car makes, uh, all these logos and kind of stuff, which uh, could provide out more uh, useful information if you I want to have a really finer ground of information uh, there, and really try the uh, web pre, uh, web pretrend uh, bleep to version first before you actually go into the fine tuning phase, which is uh, more expensive. And usually, I would say the um, bleep to 
Richmond uh, version is um, probably strong enough for a lot of uh, a lot of this uh, applications. You kind of anticipated another question I had with the car makes. So I'm in Detroit, Michigan. The auto industry, you know, here is uh, in our blood. One of the challenges that car makers have a lot of times is identifying their cars down to like the model. And then they've got the trim, which is like the specific package that they have. So do you think it would be, let's assume, and they have lots of data, right? Plenty of shots of all of these cars. Do you think it's feasible to get to the point if you had a significant scale data set where you could get accurate down to, you know, the the model of the car and even like the details of the car? Have you seen people push the performance to that like very high level in a, in a narrow range with Blip? I think it's definitely possible uh, if you have good enough and large enough data set. Uh, I don't see any reason that uh, you cannot do it. Uh, I think currently in terms of more like research perspective, uh, we, we, we don't really have access to those finer grain data set. Uh, but we are trying to improve little on certain domains that could be more widely applicable. Like those you mentioned, we try to improve on OCR, we try to improve some other capabilities by like specific tuning on the individual domains. So I would say that's definitely some way, uh, the, uh, a good, good way to improve the performance on specific downstream tasks. Cool. Well, let's, I mean, we've kind of gone back and forth a little bit between Blip and, and Blip2, and it's funny because I'm just a, such a Blip stan uh, that I, I want to talk about it from all these different angles. But your new thing is Blip2, and that has superseded, as you said, even the original and is more general and has this, I think the most fascinating part about it is the fact that it uses and really connects these pre-trained vision or image and then pre-trained language models and kind of helps them to work together. My gut says that this is going to be a big trend, right? Because we're seeing the proliferation of the language models and as well as the image models, but especially language models are really you know, going uh, wild right now. And yet, you know, the, the 200 days, as much as that's not the biggest thing that's ever been done, it's prohibitive for most projects, right? Most people cannot get to that, if only because the cycle time is just going to be too slow and they just don't have the calendar time to figure all that out, right? That's, that's a lot of research. Now, Blip2, also a lot of research, but the training time, because, the, because it's a connector model, because it's so many fewer parameters, I believe is down to 10 days on a single machine. And I assume that could be parallelized down to either even shorter run times. So I really want to unpack a little bit this connector model. Tell us, like, where did the idea for the connection style model come from? I really want to get your vision for what that's going to look like over the next couple of years. Yeah, I, I think what you mentioned is, is a very insightful point. And that, that's something actually we, we try to push in the big two paper because Initially, we find that there's all these amazing vision models, right? You have people just dedicating to pre-train better vision models with the self-supervised learning or contrast learning. And you have another group of NLP researchers trying to push the boundary of these language models, right? You have instruction tuning and all these GPT-style models. But for vision language domain, people are still doing pre-training from scratch. So that's kind of puzzling for me uh, is why can't you just bring the available progress together, right? And you do some kind of connection that uh, you can have a very flexible way to, to combine different models and efficient way so that you can harvest from this uh, progress from the individual field. So that's kind of our motivation. I think in terms of the connector module itself, the architecture, we are heavily inspired a few uh, uh, from a few previous work because we use this kind of query technique to extract uh, features and we have this cross attention. So of course it's uh, uh, inherited from Blip, Blip, uh, uh, previous Blip architecture. Uh, where we also inspired from uh, models like the, the data uh, 
which is kind of the first model that uses Curie, one of the first to use Curie to extract features. And also Flamingo is, uh, is one of the previous work that also uses kind of Curie mechanism. But I think what we find different is not really the, the architecture itself, right? So this connector module, there are different ways to build it. I think we choose a one, one of the most efficient way so that you don't need to change anything about the language model. You just plug in as kind of prompt tuning. So, so, uh, but I would like to highlight that the reason we make it work is because of the, our pre-training strategy. And this is really something unique uh, from, from Blip to, I think, because we have this two-stage pre-training strategy. So what we did is that we first connect this connector to the vision model and do pre-training. So that this connector is very well aligned with the vision model, right? So it can understand the vision information very well in terms of how the text can uh, correlate to, to, to the image features. And then only after this stage, we plug in the language model and adapt this connector so that it can work as a bridge between this vision model and language model. And what we find in our paper is that if you remove the first stage, you just do a connection between these two models and you do this kind of image captioning loss, then the performance becomes much, much worse. And there will be phenomena like, like catastrophic forgetting, which was widely observed in previous papers like Flamingo that just use this kind of generation loss of the, uh, uh, of the star. So, so I think the reason is that we need this connector to have a good understanding first before it learns how to uh, teach the language model to generate. Because this language model, they are really large. They, they, they are prone to overfitting. Right? They, they don't really have any understanding about the image. So that's why like, this pre-training strategy, I would say, is the most useful technique that we try to propose. And it's also applicable to other multimodal domains. Right? You just uh, need this connector. You, you connect to the first module first. You do some pre-training, and then you connect to the second module, and you do some pre-training. I think that's quite a generic way to do it. And we do hope that this can be applicable to other domains and power other applications. So one of the things I think is most fascinating about it is your connector model, which really, I mean, Blip2, when you use it, is an ensemble, right? You have the image part, which is frozen. You have the language part frozen. Then you have the, the connector in the middle, which is what you've trained. It is predicting embeddings direct that get injected directly into the language model, correct? It's bypassing the text encoding and just going straight to the embedded text layer of the language model. So that in and of itself is kind of a like eye-opening thing for me. It also creates some like discomfort for me in the sense that obviously at this in February of 2023, uh, I don't think we're facing imminent danger from models like Blip2, but I sort of extrapolate this trend out a little bit and I start to think, boy, you could really connect a lot of different sensors to language models in this way. And then you could really start to cobble together, not just, let's say, bimodal, but like a truly multimodal systems. And those can start to do all kinds of things. But what is a little bit concerning to me is the, the lack of understanding of exactly what is being injected into the language model. Like, how is this understanding happening, right? It becomes ultimately pretty inscrutable. So I wonder what you think about that. And also was curious about whether you have any way to figure out if those embeddings that it is predicting are like, you know, can, can you backport those to text? Is there a way to sort of understand like in a human legible way, what exactly is being injected into the language model? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, that's a great question. I think this kind of injecting embeddings has been there for a while from this prompt tuning kind of uh, technique, right? In NLP, you have this soft prompt which are basically embeddings, and you learn those prompts and you prepend them to your text input and give this to the language model, and somehow it can guide the language model to predict certain things 
like you can fine tune the prompts to to guide the language model for a certain downstream task, and it can give you better performance. And people have tried to interpret what this prompt means. And I think so far the current conclusion is not really interpretable. Uh, it's kind of like a black box. Uh, what this soft prompt really captures, because uh, like I said, the language model is so big, right? There are so many hidden like uh, kind of limitations that can guide it towards certain things. Uh, so in terms of this soft prompt, I would say Blink2 is similar, that we are trying to provide prompt that can embed vision information. So uh, we don't really know what exactly are these vision information, uh, but they are representations of the image that the language model can make use of. And, and, and I think why we are sure that they must be representation of the image comes back to our first stage pre-training. Because in our first stage pre-training, we are using these contrast laws, we are using these image text matching laws, so that from this pre-training objective, we can be certain that this connector, like we call it a Q-former, is learning the most representative feature from the image. So it's kind of like a feature extractor, right? You extract good features from a frozen this image encoder. So we are certain of that because we, we know these are good features that represent the image well. Then we are then that's why we're confident that if you put this to a language model, then it's most likely will teach the language model about the image rather than something else. Yeah, I wonder if we can give folks even a little bit better intuition for this. I mean, as you said earlier, a picture's worth a thousand words. And it is fascinating to me that, especially with relatively little compute, right? One machine for 10 days is kind of the total thing that you can figure out a way to, pre to predict these injectable embeddings into this space, which was originally created by embedding text and which is a, interpreted as if it were text by the language model. And the loss is ultimately what comes is based on what comes out the other end of the language model. And that that all still works. It's like there is this sort of invisible kind of dark space within the language embedding space that language itself cannot access, but which this model can learn to access in such a way that it is still immediately interpretable by the language model itself. It's definitely worth small research to really find out the working mechanism. Uh, I just want to mention some of our previous efforts. Right? So we, have, we do have some previous paper that where we try to directly map the image to text, that like human interpretable text focus. And we give this text as input to the language model and see what it can do. Uh, we find that it's quite good. Uh, let's say we generate captions we, and then we give these captions as the language model uh, to the language model as context to answer questions or do some other tasks. Uh, it can perform well, but there are some limitations. And the major limitation is that those captions, they are, they, it's hard to represent everything about image. Right? So we need to first find relevant captions, relevant meaning that is relevant to my task. If I want to ask a specific question, then I need this caption to be relevant to this specific question so that I know the language model can make use of this. So, and secondly, we need to generate a lot of captions. Like one caption is not enough. We need to maybe generate 20, 30, or, or even more to hopefully capture more information about the image. So, so that's why we changed to this paradigm where we inject embeddings, because each embedding is itself a vector. And uh, I think it's 70, uh, 768 dimensional vector. And we have 32 of these vectors. And this actually can capture quite a lot of information. Uh, because if you consider images itself, it's just 200 by 200 pixels. And now we kind of trans uh, trans transfer the knowledge into uh, these embedding vectors. How do we make sure these are interpretable by the language model, right? If we just randomly generate these vectors and we give the language model and we ask the language model to generate the text, 
it's likely there are a thousand ways that knowledge model can interpret image and, and, and generate some type. So, so that's most previous approach are using, like they just train with this knowledge model and also at the end, right? So that the training signal is purely coming from the language model's output and back propagate to this connector. Uh, and there are a lot of ways for this connector to, to basically cheat. So it can cheat such that during training, it can guide the language model to produce certain output, but it cannot really generalize. It doesn't really understand the image. Right? It's just uh, cheating because it can change its own output, kind of adapt to the language model. So again, that's why we need this first stage to make sure this connector itself has really good understanding of the image. And that's why during our two-stage pre-training, right, our first stage actually takes longer time. So we take maybe six days to pre-train the first stage. And the second stage, when we plug in the language model, we only need maybe two days. So that's a drastic difference from previous approach. And this also means that after we pre-train this connector first, we can plug in different language model, and it doesn't take much time to adapt. So because the connector itself already have good understanding of the image, right? It's hard for itself to like because it tries to find the shortcut. So new, uh, deep learning models always try to learn the most easy solutions to to certain problem. If there's a shortcut, it, it will find it. Right? So and we by making it to understand the image first, is is shortcut is the, the, these obvious solutions will disappear because it cannot really like overfit. Right? It's basically the easier solution for for the connector is now. I need to understand the image because it already knows the image. So that's become easier solution for it. So that's why I think it works well in our case. And we don't really just rely on the language model to teach the connector, but we kind of pre-teach it first so that it can teach the language model instead. That's really interesting and definitely gives me a better understanding than I had just from reading the paper. So thank you. Have you gone as far as to try to find because you, you might think, okay, what's the closest I could get if I just had text to the embeddings that are predicted by the connector model? Have you tried to figure that out? And if so, like, are you able to get at all close? Or is it just kind of like a totally different universe that the, that the connector, or to, let's probably better analogy would be totally different language that the connector model is speaking? Uh, yeah, I would say it's quite difficult to map the output of the connector to certain text tokens uh, because, like you said, this, this language model space, input space, is so huge, right? This, uh, I don't think it's really interpretable by human uh, language, but I do think there is a lot of information there, uh, maybe not in the form of human interpretable, but definitely interpretable by the language model. And uh, I do see a lot of research work can be done in that space to try to make it less of a black box for us. I kind of think of language models increasingly, especially with the rise of these connector models, as kind of like the executive function of these kind of expanding ensembles that increasingly are going to be fairly general, I think, and can kind of do a lot of different things. In a way, it's not that dissimilar from how we see, right? Like we have our eyes, the eyes kind of take in raw <laughs> light and turn that into a signal. And that signal goes through the nerve and finally gets back to the back of the brain. And by that point, it's not that interpretable either, right? It doesn't necessarily correspond to language. But then there's some further connector that like turns that visual data into something that I can understand as language, or at least understand and then articulate as language. So it, it feels like there is something kind of analogous taking shape in the AI world right now, where the, the language model feels like kind of a center, you know, and I, I'm not big on analogies. I honestly am very suspicious of analogies. So tell me, I want to hear, I want to hear why you think this analogy is wrong or where, where you think it falls short. But it does, it feels intuitively like there's this kind of analogy between kind of myself or my kind of conscious awareness and my narrative, you know, uh, center. And then obviously the eyes and the, the image models are analogous. And you've kind of now created the circuits that connect the two. Do you like that analogy? <laughs> Do you think that that is 
uh, missing the mark? How is, how is that falling short? I think that's a very good analogy, to be honest. Uh, I think the reason why these knowledge models are so powerful now is because they are portraying basically on the entire web, right? So the, the, the amount of knowledge and information is so much uh, on the web. And, and in particular, right, these texts, they are very concentrated information. So I would say with the current kind of deep learning model and transformers, uh, it's easy to learn from text than from images because the images are raw pixel, right? They, it takes it takes some pre-processing to really understand what, what's going on. But these texts, they are very, like one word can encompass uh, a lot of the information in that. I think that's why the language model have been very successful in, in learning this kind of word knowledge and have conversations, right? Answer questions and do all these kind of amazing tasks. So, 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 so I do see that this is kind of a kind of a brain, right? In, in the current status, at least this language model can be considered as the 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 central piece that holds all the knowledge. And, and then what we are trying to do is that can we bridge this right knowledge to some other modalities and make it process other modalities information. Uh, th this could be hard because these language models, they have never seen those data, right? Like imagine you are a human, you grew up learning only knowledge, and now one day you, you can open your eyes, right? You don't really know how to how to interpret what, what you see. So, so that's what we are trying to do here, uh, to kind of build this bridge be between these two modalities. And, and, and I do see there is a potential that by adding additional vision or other modalities, this language model itself can also improve. So we are giving it more information to learn from. And uh, for now, we are keeping the language model frozen because mostly our data, this image and text data is not so great uh, that in the sense that the image is good, but the text corresponding to this data are limited. And so, so let's say we have better quality text or even like uh, better paired image and text. Potentially, I do see there is a way we can teach the language model to further improve from this additional data as kind of a new knowledge it can learn from. And I can see a pretty direct path to that. I mean, you you already have just combining a couple ideas from your your last few papers, slicing. One thing we're going to try. We haven't done this quite yet because you just sent me the paper the other day, but with Waymark, we're going to at least start to experiment a little bit with slicing images into just pieces, like slice them into four square, four rectangles or nine rectangles or whatever, caption each of those, then maybe use a language model to try to synthesize all those captions into kind of one overarching caption. I've seen some of that stuff with video as well, where you take a frame every second or whatever, and then caption all of those and then use a language model on top of that. And you can kind of synthesize the narrative. Um, and again, this is all just frozen stuff, right? I'm talking like, I think I did that with text DaVinci too. Um, you know, here's a bunch of, bunch of captions. Tell me what must be going on in this video. And that works off the shelf. So it seems like there's, we're now entering kind of a phase two where it would probably take a significant amount of compute to do this. But I would expect that if you went back through like the Lion data set, for example, and revisited either some of those noisy images or even some of the better ones that just may have short captions and kind of ran a process like that, you could probably enrich the data set quite a bit and end up with a data set that you could then do go back to the end to end training with. So is that kind of the direction that you guys are headed next? Am I, am I picking up where you're going? Exactly. Uh, I think actually this has been done, uh, not exactly like what you described, uh, but it has been done. So like I said, in our previous three paper, we already kind of generated synthetic captions on these nine images. We didn't really slice them into different uh, uh, crops, right? That's definitely something we, we would have done, but I think due to this efficiency and speed uh, concern, like nine data set is so huge, right? We just randomly sample captions for each image. But I think after the bleep, the paper, the, the Lion team the, themselves, they actually have this version called Lion uh, Synthetic Caption or Coco Caption dataset, right? 
where they use the split model to generate uh, captions. Uh, and they make sure the captions are higher quality. So they do some random sampling and they even do some paraphrasing. Uh, and that data set, in my opinion, is quite good in terms of the quality. Uh, it may lack some diversity because it's generated by just one model, one brief model. So if you compare to the web data, it may lack some diversity, but that's definitely a much higher quality that the text are more aligned with what, what the, the image is about. Yeah. Do you think that these techniques will work for other modalities? Like when I think of video, for example, or sound, the one thing that jumps out immediately is like there's a time dimension to those that complicate things quite a bit. Um, with video, I can more easily imagine just like downsampling and kind of running things that way. With sound, it feels like it would be a bit of a bigger leap, but Ultimately, I also kind of imagine that it, it would be going to be smart enough to figure that out. Do you anticipate that similar techniques will work across like all these different modalities? Uh, I, I would say so. Like for videos, like I said, it's quite actually quite straightforward to just adapt Flip2 to, to video input. You just like uh, downsample certain frames, right? To add a time step uh, position encoding to each frame and give this to the, to the encoder, right? So that they can encode all, all the frames in and keep track of, of their relative uh, positions in, in the time dimension. And for sound, I'm not really expert in sound, but uh, I would say you can do a similar thing, right? You have these sound encoders that can encode these uh, uh, wave signals. And then you have this language model that can understand language, right? You try to bridge those two using some of our technique. Uh, I would say it too would definitely work. So ultimately, this feels like kind of one path to something like AGI, right? I think obviously people have very different things in their mind when they talk about AGI, but take a sort of chat GPT or a Claude and maybe like a next generation of those and equip them with all of these connector models where they have kind of the ability now to understand visual data and the ability to understand sound data. And then you can also imagine potentially connector models coming out the other side too, right? Like if you strip off that kind of last layer that turns all the logits into token, into a single token prediction, and you sort of take that like last probability distribution and feed that into another connector model, like it doesn't seem like a huge stretch that you could get action or sort of motion predictions out of that. So is that is that like a of the macro vision that you guys are working toward? Do you see yourselves as kind of building toward this sort of giant, you know, ultimately like this colossus of a giant ensemble that ultimately can be sort of a, a super powerful system? Yeah, our vision is to build this kind of a ultimate multimodal kind of system where you can do a lot of things, not only image, you can also maybe do coding and do actions uh, and understand other modalities data. I think that's something we are trying to build. Uh, and I would definitely love to have the larger like ChatGPT model to, to train with, but unfortunately that's not um, available. So, so I think at Salesforce research, like what we are trying to push is we want, to, first of all, open source all the models we, we have. Uh, so we, I think almost 100% of our research will, will be delivered to the community with open source code and models. And, and we are also trying to kind of democratize this AI kind of pre-training in particular because they are so costly, like in particular those language models, right? They are so costly to train. Uh, I think most uh, practitioners won't have the resource to, to train them. Uh, so that's why we're trying to propose these techniques that is more like a methodology rather than a model that you, that you can uh, in a more convenient way, an uh, efficient way to make use of these available models. Uh, and you can add on top of our method, you can add some other strategies that like you have this efficient uh, adapter module that you may want to try. So, so I think it opens up a door for others to really uh, make use of these large models because we can really adapt them but keep them frozen during our training. What should we be on the lookout for from you guys next? Yeah, we got some exciting news. Uh, don't you? We'll have a new model. 
coming out soon. Uh, uh, it's about text to image generation. So uh, yeah, uh, I feel that could be quite exciting. And also on the split tool, we are working on the next version, which hopefully will be even stronger than, than in the card model. It is amazing the pace of research right now. Do you guys feel like everything you do is working? Like, are there a lot of failures that you're like not publishing or is it basically like all the projects are working? There are definitely failures. Uh, so I think our kind of strategy is we, we focus on a direction first. Right? So a topic and direction that we feel like it will be impactful to the community. And then we work on that. So uh, we, we can meet some failures in the way, but because we are confident that this will work in the end, we will continue to push for it. And, and most of the time, eventually we will we'll, we'll meet our target. I, th I think yeah, uh, a lot of these failures in research, they are, they are not necessarily just failures. They succeed at the different degrees. <laughs> so like uh, if you want to get AGI, you don't get it immediately after one grand research project, but it's, it takes a lot of uh, uh, iterative efforts. So we are... Uh, we succeed in the sense that we uh, believe we are making steady progress towards that goal. And uh, we also want to take some risks uh, in the meanwhile so that we can uh, always explore something that we are curious about and uh, not just, uh, and also to tell people something we discover, uh, not just uh, to, you know, uh, pushing of the metrics and uh, benchmarking results. We just really want to share the insights and discoveries uh, so that ours can also uh, benefit from uh, our findings. And this is, um, to, to do that, it's also important that we ensure our uh, methods and codes and things are all open sourced. And I think we are a, um, we really benefit a lot from the open source community from others. Uh, especially this flip two model, we leverage we leverage this open source vision and the language models, and uh, we really want to say that uh, their fit this community feedback and community efforts are really important to uh, pushing the development of AGI, and we are also quite uh, committed uh, to that. What are your guys' first languages, and what do you speak in the like? office environment? Is it all English at work or is it a mix of things? Yeah, we, our team come from quite diverse uh, uh, countries. Like Dongxu and I, we are from China. We also have team members here like from Singapore, Vietnam, India. So at office, we speak English. That's kind of the official language. But uh, yeah, personally, Dongxu and I, we will we, 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 we speak Chinese. Being able to speak at a high level on technical topics in another language, I think is impressive. I guess before too long, we might have some AI babblefish that could kind of sort everything out in real time. But for now, I'm relying on uh, on your English ability, obviously. How has AI affected how you guys work on a day-to-day -day basis? Are there any tools that have made an impact on your daily workflow? Yeah, don't you maybe can speak to that? He's a heavy co-pilot user. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are a lot of things happening behind the the scene that we may not be directly aware. I'm quite sure that this search result uh, on, for example, Google, a lot of AI is going on behind. So I think uh, uh, I Google a lot of things every day uh, on Stack Overflow. That's the that's the main thing I rely on coding. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, in terms of that, uh, having improved the search efficiency using this. AI is power efficient. And recently, I also uh, I also gave $8 to Microsoft every month for the Copilot subscription. <laughs> and sometimes it gave me a bug, but it was taking me some days to figure out, especially for machine learning experiments. But uh, for most of the time, for like, um, for example, one of them is they, this boilerplate code. It really helped a lot. And it's... Uh, uh, code comments, 
uh, testing cases, unit tests, it really saved me a lot of time. And uh, uh, that, uh, yeah, I really, uh, so, sometimes I don't, I don't just, uh, I, I may not feeling uh, of it, uh, but if I disable that plugin, I feel like my life quality has worsened a lot. <laughs> so I really have to keep paying for the subscri subscription. And uh, yeah, and I, I want to look at this because um, I'm right now, uh, as you mentioned, I'm working on this text image generation uh, project, and I uh, keep an eye on this forum on uh, Redis and all this in-face community. And there are a lot of this um, very surprising and uh, impressive, impressive uh, image generation result every day. And that really blows my mind that I also learned a lot from there. It's not just uh, about uh, entertaining, but sometimes I also uh, get to know people. What are the most uh, inter interesting things to people? Uh, yeah, that's also about uh, amazing. Cool. Thank you. I'm also a big co-pilot fan, so I can totally relate to that and a big Hugging Face fan. Um, so we're definitely sharing tools that's from... 12 time zones away. Yeah, we, we have uh, some in-house code generation models, and hopefully I don't need to pay that subscription soon. I'm sure you're aware of how Replit used their Ghostwriter model was a distillation, I believe, from the Salesforce code gen method. So if you want to, I don't know if you've used the, the Replit Ghostwriter, but it's also very good. And they also now have a chat mode Hard to say, I would both Copilot and uh, Replit, I think, are advancing pretty quickly. It's amazing that Replit's not that big of a company. And they are, I would say, keeping pace with Copilot, but certainly got a big jump out of the gate by being able to build on the, the Salesforce code gen. So if you haven't checked that out already, I definitely recommend it as well. You guys are doing, I think, some really useful work with the blip set of models. Um, as I said at the top, much more enduring than almost anything else that we see in AI right now. So that's awesome. You have this kind of understanding of how this work fits into a bigger picture of kind of an ensemble strategy for AGI. But zooming out even a little bit further, kind of thinking about society, thinking about the, the change that we're all about to see over the next however many years as AI kind of it goes from a research agenda to an applied reality in life. What are your biggest hopes and also what are your biggest fears for what AI could mean for all of us? Uh, that's a big question. <laughs> I think in my biggest hope is, I think it's getting close, right? Uh, like I'm surprised by the advancement every day. So I think it is the progress is even beyond what I can hope for now. It's developing so fast, uh, and with all this journey to AI, like I think this year or, or for the past two years, it has been re really uh, growing fast. I I don't really fear it in the term because uh, like it's it literally. Speaking, because we are the one fundamentally who, who build these models. So I would say maybe there is a, the public has a different opinion on this AGI, but as a researcher, I would still consider them to be quite artificial and, and even stupid <laughs> a lot of times. Uh, and, and I know it is not as far from like sen sentient or, or perfect as it's been. Fundamentally, it's just a big neural network. It is far from what we expect from humans. So, so I was looking forward to that day to to come in the future. Yeah, I think in the meantime, now uh, while we are uh, innovating, uh, we also um, pay attention to kind of related ethic issues on these foundational models, and we have a ethical team who help us to review uh, our uh, use cases and uh, especially on some of the demos we are making. And uh, we 
I think we have seen uh, a couple of uh, examples of this um, uh, kind of threatening user large language model interactions uh, in some of these recent uh, uh, large language chatbot. And we want to make sure that eventually we are responsible with, uh, our model is responsible for uh, what it is actually producing, it's understanding what it's doing, uh, not just to abuse it to the cases that are harmful in any sense to the human. And we do emphasize that a lot, and uh, our uh, ethics teams, um, they work very hard to ensure that uh, our delivery and the development is uh, safe and uh, also uh, production ready when we want to develop, uh, deploy that. And then just to add on top of that, we, we, this external AI is also one of our major focus. And we do have a library called OmniXAI that is all about how do you interpret models predictions uh, to make really safe and uh, uh, like interpretable decisions based on those AI models. Awesome. Well, Junan Lee, Dongshu Lee, thank you guys very much for joining us on the Cognitive Revolution. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Omniki uses generative AI to enable you to launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work, customized across all platforms with a click of a button. I believe in Omniki so much that I invested in it and I recommend you use it too. Use Cogrev to get a 10% discount.